Hello and welcome to Fire Headlines, where we cover the hottest topics in fire service news. I'm your host, Samantha Didion, and today I am joined by the panel, Chief Bob Horton and Chief Jeff Buchanan. Our topic this week is next generation bulletproof firefighter helmets. An article recently shared in the Daily Dispatch discusses how the responsibility of a firefighter has evolved to now include responding to active shootings. My take on this article is that, you know, it is sad that we have to go to these lengths to protect our firefighters. It is sad that a firefighter getting injured by an active shooter while on duty is such a real threat in today's world. And I really wonder how this threat may impact recruitment in the fire service. But on the other hand, of course, we have to do whatever we can to protect all of our first responders, right? And if that means bulletproof helmets, then that's what it means. But let's hear what our panel is thinking. Jeff, what are some of your thoughts on this? Yeah, first of all, great to see you, Samantha. Good to see you, BOB, uh, and talk about this topic. I, 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 it's necessary. You know, we're talking about a specific portion of the PPE, the helmet, which we'll get to in just a second. But we've really been through this. This has been an evolution in the fire service going back to the, uh, the riots in L.A. decades ago, where firefighters across the country were outfitted with ballistic protection. And uh, then, it, then it resurfaced again decades later. And so there's kind of been this, this undulating, it's necessary for ballistic protection, not necessary for ballistic protection. And I think now we've, we've hit a, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, where now ballistic protection uh, vests are are really on most of the fire apparatus across the country, or maybe that's unfair to say most, but quite a few of them in the regards to rescue task forces because of the involvement with firefighters and active shooters. So we've, we've, we've been doing this for a long time. But what I really like about this particular uh, topic of conversation and what the Department of Homeland, uh, Homeland Security Science and Technology and this directorate that they did in 2019 and, and looking at ballistic protection for, for, for helmets, because I think this is going to set the stage. I'm hoping it sets the stage for a complete evolution of the helmet. I mean, yes, am I a fan of the ballistic protection? And do I think that it's wise to give a firefighter a multi-dimensional helmet that allows them to do their good work? in different and far-ranging environments? Well, heck yeah. Uh, the, the reality is firefighters go into a lot of weird places and they are susceptible to a whole heck of a lot of different dangers, including people that are shooting at them. And so I, I love where this is going, but we have done, the fire industry has done a terrible job of not evolving, particularly in the area of a helmet we give in quite a bit to traditionalism, which is cool. Traditionalism is cool. Reality is is that the fire helmet that you see, the traditional fire helmet is ergonomically not sound. And it's it's not great for you. (laughs) How about that? It's not. Uh, The reality is is that uh, the way that the, the traditional fire helmet is designed It is unstable. It it weighs too much. It's bulky. Shoot, even inside of a fire environment, it it provides an opportunity to get snagged if you're crawling. I mean, it sits high on top of your head. I could go on and on and on. But I'll tell you, and I'll share a couple of, let me share this anecdote with you, that uh, a few years ago, I was at a conference. It was for um, PPE. And we went into NC State, which apparently, and I didn't know this, is one of the top textile research institutions in the country, which they, they research materials for any number of different things, but they, one of their, one of their areas of study was in personal protective equipment for, for fire departments. And I asked the scientists there, I said, can you provide me with a, a reason of when you're looking at the, you know, it's, it's called the Euro style helmet, it's called the jet fighter helmet. Now it's being called the modernized helmet. Pick your poison. 
why we aren't using that helmet and the rest of the world is. And we're, we continue to use this traditional helmet. He couldn't give me one scientific reason because of this notion of traditionalism, right? Let me go one step further. There's an organization called the Fire Apparatus Manufacturers Association, FAMA. And they, they, one of the things that they do is they put out kind of warning signs that are that you'll find in different places on fire apparatus. And one of their warning signs, I just looked it up today, see if it was still there. <laughs> you betcha. They warn against wearing a fire helmet inside of a moving fire engine because of a danger of getting decapitated. That's the oddity of the design of the fire helmet. Now, I know I'm in sacrilegious gr uh, ground here, and Bob's probably going to want to jump in here. Um, and I'm going a little bit off the beaten path because the focus question that we're talking about is ballistic. And where, where do I see the value there? Well, I do. I think that the reality is that this, this new evolution of helmet should be what the Department of Homeland Security and the science technology is intending it to do. Yes, offer protection in different environments but also be ready to adopt and adapt to the technologies that are needed for firefighters to do their great work. Communications, uh, infrared, uh, thermal imaging cameras, you know, uh, integrated into the helmet. So I, I, I want to see technology embraced, but I do want to see them become more ergonomic. And I, and I, I, I just think it's important. It would be better for the firefighters and their, head and neck safety to see this evolution of course from a ballistic standpoint it will keep them more safe but i hope that this is uh, uh really a nudge in the direction where i think we've we've needed to be in a long time and that is to evolve the helmet so it is functional for the firefighter and uh, still want to make it cool right still want to make it cool but that it provides them much more safety than the helmets that are out there today in a, in a wide range of different environments and a wide range of jobs that firefighters got to do every day. I, I love where this research is going and where it's saying we need to go and to provide another level of safety. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Hopefully there'll be some, some great evolution. How about you, Bob? What are your thoughts on this new helmet or maybe even the reasoning for why we need the new helmet? Jeff did a great job with his analysis of just the helmet in general. And when he first mentioned to me about this sticker inside a helmet, I didn't believe him. Like I, I, I threw a challenge flag and he had to give me evidence that it in fact had a sticker and a warning that said you could be decapitated if you wear this inside a fire engine. Uh, so I, I found it sadly humorous that we still want to fight for that to be the PPE element of choice in this particular shape and design because of culture and traditionalism. I think we built, put it in one of our presentations, Jeff. We are constrained in the, the safety and technological advancements to firefighting because of our resistance to change helmet design. And I think that is a sad state of affairs on the heels of a shared interest between labor and management, shared interest between labor and management on increasing safety of our firefighters. They can't go to a fire department across the country where there isn't a safety committee who is meeting monthly and talking about how to make the environment safer. And the design of the helmet is one, the least safe, design of helmets on the market. I'm sure we could design one that is slightly more or less safe that had spikes coming out the top of it or something like that. But the ones, if you go look at available fire helmets for purchase, we're using some of the least safe ones that are available on the market because that's what we think is cool. And I just offer that it's different. You know, the Euro helmets, or I didn't know that they were under some different names. I, I think the marketing of that is important. So I think changing what its name is, is probably very helpful in advancing that I've sat in, in conversations with, you know, strong traditionalist firefighters where we just initiate the conversation around if you could have inner intercom communication with your crew inside an ideal H environment, do you want it? And I'm not talking about do you, you got like that, that radio 
extension thing hanging off the side of your turnout coats and your heads like tilted, you know, with your ear up against it hearing like, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about how the uh, you know, offensive coordinator and quarterback coach is communicating with the, the quarterback in the field through their helmet design. And if you've been watching any football recently, you've seen some of the commercials about those who are hearing impaired and the advancements in technology and their helmets that have the screen displays that are able to flash and show words for those who are hearing impaired so that they can enjoy football in a similar way. Those of us who can hear well do anytime we have that conversation. Yes. I want that technology. Yes. I want to be able to have seamless communication with my crew inside a fire. Perfect. This helmet can do it. Nope. Full sail rejection because the shape looks different. Now they say it looks stupid, but I would argue you know, football helmet doesn't look stupid and an F-18 fire pilot doesn't look stupid. You know, these NASCAR racers helmets don't look stupid. We think it just, it's different. Therefore, it, therefore it's stupid. So I, you know, yes, if, if a helmet can be ballistically safe and it doesn't compromise on these other elements of safety, meaning it's heavier or more awkward or not, then yes, of course we would want one to be, to have a ballistic safety as well. NFPA, I think it's NFPA 3000, the one on active shooter and hostile work environments is where those recommendations started coming out to putting ballistic gear because there was a changing environment for firefighters. And, and, and Samantha, to your concern, you know, these, these aren't, you know, these are environments that we train and you prepare for, and it isn't wild west suggesting you just, you know, charge out into rapid gunfire, like we might expect military or train military to do and un underserving how their tactics are. But that's a different level of force that our law enforcement and, and our military are trained to do that our firefighters aren't. But in those rare cases that you are exposed to fire, you know, gunfire, there's an option for personal protective equipment that can help protect you from that. My final point on, on helmets is, you know, we do you know, these various hazard approaches as different response were trained for hazmat, trained for technical rescue, water rescue, wildfire, uh, the, the ballistic stuff we've been talking about and, and fire. I mean, we got, you know, you could, have, you could potentially have six different helmets, one person trained to these different things. You got all these different helmets. I mean, if there's an opportunity to consolidate helmets down so that you don't have to choose between six different options, that's probably a good thing too. I want to throw in a, a, a couple other points here and talk about weight for a second. If you if you take a chance, take a look at that Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology Directorate that was put out in regards to the fire helmets. And this is done in 2019, which it's noteworthy is that is it lists and shows different pictures of different firefighter helmets. The traditional ones say that you have to contact the manufacturer to to get the weight of it. And, and I'm just going to speculate here, and it's probably because it's fairly significant. And the whole idea with some of these other helmets is that they're they're lighter weight. And I want to offer this anecdote. It's it was actually a super interesting book. It was called the I think it was called the was it the last race. It was uh, Lance Armstrong, and it, it it basically unpacked his his entire tour to France career and, you know, his doping and all this other, like I said, it was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, but one of the things that happened inside of that book is it talked about how the reduction in weight is the key to speed, plain and simple, the reduction in weight, like they, that all of these people on side of the tour were so from their equipment down to their own body weight, they, they needed to be as light as possible in order to gain speed. And I bring that correlation into what fi firefighters are, you know, they're, and, and some people debate this, they're referred as tactical athletes. And, and so the, where I would present as an argument in this case is why wouldn't any firefighter want something lighter and that offers more protection and provides more mobility? It's almost counterintuitive, but it, it, it points to the strength of culture and traditionalism in such a, a cool industry like the fire service, how, how difficult it is to evolve with the it, it really facing headwinds of traditionalism and, and strong culture, which again, I, I mean, I think that there's some really, really cool aspects of fire culture for sure. But, uh, you know, in a case like this, I think to the detriment of a firefighter when, when we're not involving. So I, I think that if, if we can get to a place where 
We are offering a, a fire helmet that offers ballistic protection that is much more adaptable to technology and, and the ways that we're talking about with self-contained breathing apparatus, with communications and with thermal imaging detection so they can locate the sea of the fire and put it out more quickly. I think that it, it's going to be a step in the right direction and it'll be a big change for, for firefighters to move away from a traditional style helmet. But I think that the long-term value will supersede going in a, in a different direction. And, and that long-term value will be less neck injuries. It'll be less back injuries. It'll be less, you know, less, less over uh, a lengthy career debilitating challenges that we find that I, that I think uh, our traditional helmets have a lot to do with. From what you guys are saying, it sounds like maybe a lot of firefighters who are very dedicated to the fire service traditions may need to ask themselves, you know, is keeping the tradition more important than my own safety and well-being? But I'm curious, Bob and Jeff, say these new high-tech, well-advanced helmets do become widely adopted in the U.S. Do you see the fire service possibly changing from that? Like, do you see improved communication, maybe even improved response times or results? You know, talk to me a little bit about that. I'll I'll jump in here. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here, Samantha. Yes. Do I see response times being quicker with the evolution of technology and actually using it 100 percent you're going to think you're going to see speed i think increase in a lot of different areas you're talking specifically about a a, a helmet and if we had integrated thermal imaging cameras and if you had the ability to be uh, much more mobile inside of your ensemble your personal protective equipment including your your helmet speed and efficiency is 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 going to increase for sure. Uh, you could see, and, and based on efficiency, you could one could make an argument. If I'm wearing a bulky snowmobile suit, which is a lot like what a fire ensemble is, it's like this bulky again snowmobile suit versus a sleeker, more ergonomically designed ensemble, whatever that looks like. We're talking about a helmet. I'm going to work less and stay in a fire potentially more and get more done and use less air and therefore could have to leave the fire less and could potentially be less crews. There's a, there's a cascading amount of potential positive impacts that could be born from adapting technology like this. Again, I'll focus on if, if one would just think of themselves in a a better fitting, better designed ensemble that allows them to be more mobile, agile, and hostile inside of an environment, they're just going to be they're going to be better. It's very difficult to, and, and that is that is making a couple of presumptions: one, that they're equally safe, uh, and that be they meet all of the standards. Right? If you had one that's bulky versus one that's not. And you could increase your efficiency. Why? Why wouldn't you do that? Um, and to your point, if it if it was wildly adapted, I I do. I think we become better as an industry because it also shows that we are listening to the science, that we're following the science, and not giving in to anecdotes, which is hard to do especially inside of the fire service when it's so rich in tradition. I mean, we could, we could talk about, there's so many things that are inside of the fire service that it, 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 we don't involve or, or evolve because of the, the challenge of traditionalism looking different. You know, I, I was in three different organizations and I, I, I don't think the best option is to force things but it is to provide options and, and hopefully nudge people in a direction where they they they, they will go. Um, in this case, a more safe, uh, a more more safe helmet. Uh, and one of the organizations I was in brought in modern helmets, and they look cool. I got to tell you, they look cool. Gave them to a company for, jeez, uh, it was at least a month, if not two months. Came back. How was it, everyone? What'd you think? How was the functionality? They all loved it. They loved it but let me tell you what they didn't love was all the ridicule that they received 
all the ridicule, all the ridicule that they received on all the fires. And there was, uh, you know, people, they came up with their own creative ways to uh, make fun of them. And they didn't like that. So those helmets never gained any tread and no one ever, no, no one ever selected them. But so those are, you know, it's a big obstacle, but it's real, right? Samantha, you might remember that we had a similar experience trying the modern helmets and the reaction was the same thing that Jeff had. It was from a functionality standpoint, high marks, got teased by other people and didn't want them anymore. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. I differ with Jeff a little bit. I, I My mindset is like, at least from a policy perspective, that this needs to be driven and needs to be forced. Here's what I would do. I, I would I would align the incentives in, in the right space to move this industry in the direction that it needs to go. Because I don't know, to your point, to the scientist you spoke to earlier, that there's a compelling case not to advance the helmet into the modern modern zone. I'm open to hearing that. And I hope the folks who have other than a traditional argument, but have actually a functionality argument uh, would share that with us through uh, the email address. But here's what I would do. You want an AFG grant? You want a safer grant? Guess what? You better have a plan or you better be moving forward to a modern helmet period, or you're just not going to get, you're just not going to get funded. And the U.S. Fire Administration has some influence over how these funds are going to be allocated. To me, you just make that as one of the criteria that's on there is that your organization is going to advance. In fact, I would prioritize that for agencies who are putting in an AFG for for PPE to advance and move these helmets forward in the right direction. But to your question, Samantha, here's where I'll just narrowly focus it in on uh, the tactical and the task level. And I'll even narrowly focus it in on just communication alone. You remember being on these on these fire scenes, you know, a, a second alarm incident that's anywhere, you know, let's say, you know, 30 or so. Anyway, let's say just an event incident with 20 to 30 responders that are on the scene. And for that battalion chief to communicate with that person who's on a hose line inside a structure interior has to communicate with all 30 people. At one time, they like click on the, the mic and, and speak into the radio system and everybody has to hear it. And that person has to speak back. And meanwhile, this you know person over here on, on a search can't talk because someone else is talking the whole time. And we're calling for Red Cross and we're asking for more research. Like all of this dialogue that's going on does not have to happen. And when you look at a system of, of integrated communications and intercoms where where people in, a, in an IDLH atmosphere uh, can communicate with each other intercom and the battalion chief can communicate with that officer inside without having to disrupt an entire radio channel, you are going to improve Jeff's, Jeff's right. You're going to improve efficiency on, in, in the tactical operations and on the task level operations. Communications alone is why I'm convinced we need to change the helmet. That's the technology I want to see us advance most in. And I don't want to dismiss the other stuff. I think it's good. Just me. I am interested. I was you know, trying to shout it at your firefighters at what to do while, while as an officer trying to listen to what's going on in the radio and watch out for safety hazards and all of this, all of this kind of stuff. It's uh, uh, we are so much, we have the capabilities that are, that have advanced beyond that only constrained by our culture. We got to move the needle on it. Hopefully we can see some movement on this topic, but it all starts with a discussion, which is exactly what we're doing here today. And hopefully we can encourage others in the fire service to start having these conversations as well. But thank you both for joining us today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And if you have a question for the panel, please reach out to us at fireheadlines at wfca.com and let us know what's on your mind. We'll see you back here next week for more Fire Headlines. Thank you.